Check, 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 What about, what about this? this? Check, 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 check. Check, 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 Audio? Aha. Uh -huh. How how about now? Echo? Um, no echo. My mouse just froze though. No <laughs> echo? All right. No echo. I'm learning.
My I mouse, successfully my, my mouse see died. the problems. I'm going to put this on. Uh, everybody at home, audio appears correct. Oh, yes. Check, 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 check. Check, check, check. Oh, I can't even hear myself. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, that was a, that was actually a very important unlock um, in in the game of of Brian learns. I'll be right back. I have my own crisis right now. Uh, okay, but but but, but real quick. Okay, uh, everyone at home, you were able to hear Andrew. You were able to hear Brian. And are you able to hear whatever that is? I could do this, save as. Brian understands the things 2.0. As long as you guys are hearing the music and hearing uh, me and Andrew and able to see me and Andrew, and let me just zoom in a bit on Andrew. BioCal is the blessed. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? The instructions, Brian. I do it over the chat. Tells me to. But oh, I got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for testing purposes. Wait, why would? Oh, I see. At all. I'm just gonna leave it on the two shot of us. I'm not gonna get fancy. I, I, we, no, we made, we made cares. fancy shots. Uh, I, I, just things are working, so I, I at least can put this on and I can, can go pee again because it's been a minute. Daniel I'll... J. Newman. <laughs> my, my first night, the apartment complex I moved into Burbank. I, 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 I'm running to pee. I'm not touching anything. <laughs> How are you gonna pee then? <laughs> I mean, I just come back with like wet soiled britches. <laughs> oh, Jesus, God, what kind of show is this here? So, for audio listeners here, uh, I moved into this apartment complex back when I lived in Burbank. And like my first day, first night at the grocery store, I'm walking through the aisles pushing a cart, and I look and I see Wayne Knight Newman from Seinfeld pushing a shopping cart. And he just looks at me with this kind of like, uh, you know, the guy looks exhausted. And you know, I know enough to be like, eh, it's nod and keep moving, you know? And I, I could get the feeling for him that like every interaction with somebody, he's just afraid somebody's just gonna scream, Newman or whatever. So I, I did. It's like the time I went to the Arclight movie theater and I'm waiting in line, I'm talking to my friend and I hear this voice go, Hey, uh, I think some tickets are left for me. And I look and it's Keanu Reeves, like two people I had. And it's just funny because his voice. And anyhow, I point to my friend and like, do you hear that? She's like, what? And then she hears, she goes, oh my God. Anyhow, I go walk into the restroom and uh, Keanu Reeves is like there. And he looks at me and does this sort of just like nod to acknowledge that I know that he's there, that he's there. And you just think of like what their life is like. And I'm like, I'm not gonna go bother, I'm not gonna bother anybody. Like I, Hollywood, you see a celebrity, whatever, but I'm not gonna bother somebody in the bathroom. But you gotta think that like, going to the restroom's gotta be a frightening experience if you're a celebrity, if it's a public place. Because you realize that like, you could be at the stall at whatever, and people, because it's special for them to run into you, that they may ask you for an autograph at a very inconvenient time, so. Things you don't think about. So now you do. Hopefully, let's see if my mouse is charged. Yeah, my magic mouse was down to 3%. So. Yeah, bye, Cal. Thank you for sticking around as long as you did. You're a trooper. 
but not as cool as Daniel J. Newman or unsafe DB level. No, she hasn't even started yet. Uh, we uh, were trying uh, some new technical things. The, the technical thing was getting the show going. So I think we're in a good spot now. So no, she hasn't even started. About to begin. Um, lower your expectations and everybody's going to be fine. Manage them. Um, by the way, uh, I'm going on like three hours sleep in the last 72 hours. So there's that. So um, I'm not even sure if I'm awake right now. I could still be on the airplane flying back from India and perhaps hallucinating. Just so you know, I'm not sure. Maybe you are. Maybe you're not because then you're not real. So we're real, right? So, uh, yeah. Good thing I can tell if it's real or not, because I have the top from Inception, and I'm just going to spin this and see if it keeps spinning. We'll see what happens. Spinning. Spinning. Still spinning. Starting to have my doubts. Wondering if this is real. It's still spinning. It's never spun this long before. And it's still spinning. Okay, I am dreaming. This is obviously true. Uh, wait, starting to wobble. Starting to, starting to. Okay, fell over. Not a dream. Glad I had my top to test this with. Now we know. Yeah, and in stream. And I wake up. Back in my townhouse in Fort Lauderdale where I lived oh so long ago. Yeah, we know this is, I, I, the, I've made the simulation argument before. I think statistically speaking, we are in a simulation, but there's no reason to think that it is a special simulation. And there's no reason to think that the simulation has any meaning for anybody, no more than, you know, your startup screen does or the billionth time somebody's played. I don't even think it would be a video game. I mean, we could just be a simulation determined, you know, to figure out like, the 500 quadrillionth digit of pi. I mean, that's the thing that I think people get hung up on when they talk about are we in a simulation or not, is they automatically assume that we're a special simulation, that we're a game that people are watching. When the vast amount of computation being used in our world is used for things like processing bank transactions and stuff. So we're in a simulation. We have no reason to think it's a special one. It's just one of, you know, a nearly infinite number. Well, there's such a thing as nearly infinite, but you know what I mean. So Brian, while you're gone, while you're gone, Brian, I hypothesized that I could still be on my flight traveling from India, you know, and uh, hallucinating that I'm here. And uh, thankfully, I realized. Ah, that's awesome. <laughs> Where did you get that? I spun it. I ordered it from Amazon. Uh, uh, I, I this actually I'll talk about this in after things. So there's a reason why I have this. Okay, not just because I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan. Uh, okay, as long as we come back to that, then we can talk about it. Um, here, I'm going to turn off the music, and uh, I'll just count us down, and you can bring us in. Right. Uh, ready, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hey, man. Uh, I'm really glad that <laughs> that our schedules aren't totally bonkers for one whole day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'm on the same side of the planet. Uh, so uh, I'm glad I'm on the same uh, time schedule that humans are. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you, you and I were, as we were setting up, yeah, we both had adventures. For me, it was, yeah. uh, it, it it was. I got I got the sickest I've been since pre-vaccine COVID, and uh, we've talked about this. I, it's pretty public, you know. I've got a, a bit of the ADHD and anxiety, and you you don't want to be mixing um, stimulants and uh, Nyquil or any of that stuff, no. uh, uh, at, which throws which threw my whole sleep schedule off. And I tried to play it cool, and it's like, you know, one night where you get two and a half hours of sleep, you're able to kind of fake it. The second night, you're, you know, it, it becomes, basically, I lived, 
I cosplayed Stephen King's Insomnia, where I always could fall asleep, but then it would be like just ding, wake up, and it's like, come on, baby, let's let's do some sleep. <laughs> so when I when I was in, I was in India, so I was in Mumbai, and then I went to uh, Punjab, which is near the border. This time, last time I went, I had really bad jet lag, really really bad jet lag, right? Now this time I had the perfect solution, which was. I didn't sleep on the 22 hour flight. So I was, you add up the time that I was awake. I was up for like 34 hours or so. So by the time I get to the hotel, what a matter what time, went to sleep, you know, went to sleep about 10 o'clock, whatever, adjusted. It was a little, some nights a little fading, but was for the most part completely adjusted, no jet lag at all. Last time was different. Now, the thing about jet lag, if you've never had like severe jet lag, and it's kind of you could relate to this, what you went through is your body wants to sleep, but your brain's awake. Yep. Or vice versa. Or your I, brain wants to sleep and your body wants to be awake. Well, and, and plus and also your your brain is incredibly overstimulated. I in fact I wonder if there might be some parallels to what it's like to have the ADHD because um uh, like uh, 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 it's not about me, but um, the you're suddenly in a brand new place with nothing but just really interesting things, but your body is just physically not capable of keeping <laughs> your the things you say and do in check. And for me, uh, my my journey, and I want to hear about yours, uh, 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 ended last night where uh, yesterday morning, you know, on day four of only like two hours of sleep, uh, I just sort of like, I just, uh, I could tell that both Justin and my wife were concerned for me. And they, and they are, and I was like, uh, sleep will come. And I don't intend to do very much that is important today. And then I called people who I could trust and just tried to stay up all day and they got, they're all like, Oh my God, Brian, you used to be like this all the time. I'm like, yes, this is <laughs> off medication, ADHD, Brian. And, uh, 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 and then finally, I don't know, around 10 o'clock last night, I laid down and, uh, and rocked eight full hours of sleep. And now human Brian is back. Not a jealous. I've had about three <laughs> in the last three days. Wait, you, you got wait, you got three hours. You just got back. Yeah, I got back. We we left the thirty first. To understand the thirty first in Mumbai is actually the thirtieth here, right? Because of the thing, international here's the thing about Mumbai. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite twelve hours. It, like they're a half an hour, like twelve, like it's like eleven and a half hours. So it's always hard for me to like plan. Like, like I'm like, I'm oh, screw it. I, I if it were just like ten hours, eleven hours, I could do that. When it's eleven and a half, the math gets too hard, and I just give up. Um, so yeah, we left. Our flight was four a.m. Mumbai time. So we just didn't sleep that night. Was up all day, uh, which would have been Tuesday. I'm so confused. And then we 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 got on the plane. We had two connections. I maybe nodded off for like a little bit, but I didn't like fully like sleep. And so I didn't sleep. We got back and then I took, I took like a three hour nap the day we got back the day before yesterday. Uh, and then last night um, I started to nod off. And then I, if I start to nod off and I get up again, I will not go back to sleep. It's like a thing about me. So I started not off, and then I got up, and the next thing you know, I'm watching uh, Night Skies on Amazon Prime, and, like going through like eight episodes or six episodes. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I'm always worried, like when I get too little sleep, there's a particular affect to my voice that is too scraggly, graggly, and it's like I don't want to talk yeah. to anyone, and that creates kind of like a shame spiral, and I and and I'm like I don't know what to do and all that stuff. It's it's habit routine I, matters. <laughs> I I cleared my calendar like I have like a, a edit due and I said this is I'm not I said I know I get back but like I just cleared my count like yesterday I just zoned out chilled out 
And today I'm like, well, okay, today I'll start to get some work done, you know, but I, I just told myself, I give myself some time. Cause it was like, last time I went, I was in a fog there. Thankfully I wasn't. Well, then I had, you know, worst case of food poisoning in my entire life. Uh, um, uh, okay. All right. And this is over how long of a trip? I was there three weeks. Okay. All right. So long, long I'm enough. Basically a citizen now. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, okay. Cause the one time I had an unambiguous, this is food poisoning. Uh, number one, wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, really thought I was going to die. Um, it was 24 hours of nothing. Like, um, my wife kept telling me, stop drinking anything. You're just going to throw it up. But I'm like, I would rather drink Gatorade and then throw it up than not be drinking Gatorade, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, that's the counterintuitive thing. Actually, you the more liquids you have, the sooner you pass it through. And that's the mistake because a lot of people are afraid, oh, I don't want to have liquids, I'm throw it up. Like, well, that's your body getting rid of something, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, I not to get too into it, but uh, I was in India. And it was super clean. Like this time, water, like anytime I left the hotel, I brought bottled water with me. I knew last time, like I was at a restaurant and they're like, oh, you should be fine. I had the water and no, it's not fine. Um, and so this time I was super vigilant about the water, very, very careful how to eat. But uh, was that a situation where it was going to be socially hard for me to avoid eating? And, and literally, this is a place where you walk into people's houses and they will want to put food into your mouth. Wait, you, uh, uh, cu culturally, it's like, uh, this is hospitality. Please do not be rude to me. And you're like, I don't want to be rude to you. <laughs> yeah, I, and there was a point where I had to eat something and I'm like, mm, and I and there was twice. I was like, I don't know for sure. But then it was, got back to the hotel that night and then I felt the nausea in the middle of the night. And it was two days and I brought antibiotics with me, but like, I first wasn't sure if it was viral or whatever. And somebody gave me a talk to the physician, like, oh, they gave me something to help with the nausea or whatnot. And a day later, like I had the, I had my 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 in-laws through a whole big reception for my wife on a wedding reception for us. And I was extremely ill. Like I was running to the restroom, like really, really ill. Like I could, I had to sit in a chair with an armrest, you know, to go through this, which is sad because there's like a hundred people there there to see us. And I look like the standoffish guy in the corner. Um but uh, I then, you know, afterwards I spoke to that physician. I'm like, hey, you know, I brought antibiotics with me. Should I take them? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Took them. And four hours later, you know, really feeling much better. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, 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 the antibiotics thing. You know, we, we've talked before about how, you know, uh, <laughs> you don't want everybody to follow the exact same heuristic because then we end up with a super bug or something. Uh, but, uh, uh, when when I was younger, I used to uh, there there was a brief while I don't I don't know if it's in vogue anymore, but to treat acne because acne is little infections on your face that uh, you you would take amoxicillin or 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 uh, one of the one derivative or other, and uh, I, there was a brief time because my wife's family lived close to the Mexican border that it's like uh, hey let's go down to whatever border town and you know man they don't care it's like go to the pharmacy and you're like give me that penicillin thanks bye <laughs> uh but then at, at some point acne was not a problem and i stopped but but it was nice to have whether it was a placebo or whether or not it just contributed to creating covid or what um uh, it, it is empowering to have uh literally anything to do <laughs> when you realize that uh you're getting ill so my my tip for anybody traveling what i did was last time i went i got sick and i knew it was was because of the water which is, tends to be bacterial this time what i did is i used a, i used plush care one of those online you know schedule it you know schedule it and talk to a doctor 30 minutes later um because me trying to scheduling with my Kaiser plan is like a joke. So I did plush care, called up, got got on the phone to the doc, video called the doc, said, hey, listen, going to India. Uh, last time I got food poisoning, I said, I would love to have some antibiotics to take with me just in case. And they gave me a prescription, filled that afternoon, got back. So I had that in my, you know, if I didn't need to use it, it would be fine. But there's just, you know, I'm pretty good at knowing. Like I was pretty sure it was bacterial, but a doctor was like, no, I think it's this or whatever. And I never, I never talking to like, 
get into the differences there, cultural differences, but I'm pretty good at spotting like where the thing starts if it's bacterial viral, but like anyhow, <laughs> um, I don't like wait. I don't wait. I don't want to wait 24 hours or whatever. Like, oh, we'll do a culture and see. Like, no, I'm going to take an antibiotic. Like, if it doesn't, if it's, if it's bacterial, then I'll be well. You know, a day sooner. You know, if it's viral, then <laughs> it ee, is free I, ride. You know, I remember at some point, like, uh, <laughs> learning about the prisoner's dilemma, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to default. Uh, I, I would like, I would like to be well. And I'm sorry, world, <laughs> if, if me taking this, there's no downside uh, for me taking some amoxicillin or whatever. Oh, yeah, and, and I and like I follow the course. I know like even, you know, I, I, I will take all of them all the way through the course. Like I don't stop early because that's where sometimes you can cause problems and stuff. Like I kill all the little bastards and, you know, move on, um, you know, and leave it to Big Pharma to find new antibiotics. So, so oh, the, uh, uh, okay. So you head out and you have a three week journey and, uh, you spend how many, how many days this time with the, with, you said twice, right? Oh, it, it wasn't the same trip. This is a different, the different trip. The second time. Yeah. I last, I went got four it. years ago, five years ago and I got sick and this time it was, yeah. So no, just, just each trip. So the plan originally was I have uh, my wife's cousin was getting married. And so uh, Indian weddings, for those of you who don't know, are several day affairs. You have to have different outfits, whatnot, um, including me. I had to wear uh, Punjabi style or you know Indian style uh, attire for some of the events. I've, I, I, I I've only handled. seen one photo and, uh, I, I, and I will say that you do rock the look. And it was a very excellent, joyful photo. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I do get a lot of compliments, you know, from my Indian family members about that. You know, I, I've been told that, you know, uh, but, you know, my, my wife, uh, on the other hand, like, you know, I'm going to show a photo here. This is me in Western wear, but that is my wife uh, who just total bombshell knockout when she, uh, she, yeah, she any she, time of the day. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 all uh, audio listeners. Just everything you said is 100% true. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she looks great. I look like I, you know, fit in. But yeah, I will say that one of the things I, many things I love about India and I love about like my in-laws or whatnot is that, you know, everybody was extremely welcoming. You know, my, my, my wife's cousin's wedding party, hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, I get pulled into the dance floor and I'm welcomed like everybody, one, because I'm a really good Punjabi style dancer, apparently turns out, who knew? Um, but it just, it's one of the things I love. It's very accepting. So it was a lot of fun. I had, I had an absolute blast. Um, another thing that like, but something that I really love and I'm going to sound crazy and people go, what? And like, every time I go to a foreign country, I go to the McDonald's and people go, Oh, Americans, the first place they want to go is McDonald's. No, I go there cause it's different. It's yeah. different. You see that version. Exactly. Brian excitedly pointed at the microphone. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, okay. um, uh, there, there, uh, when I, when, and this is as a child, right? So it's like, uh, in America, uh, they do make sure to, uh, keep, uh, all the systems are the same because of in infrastructure. You can all get the same equipment and all that stuff. And the beef product tends to be the same from the same distributors and all that stuff. So as a result, you, you grow up like that's the whole gimmick with, with McDonald's is what if it was always the same? And then uh, you go far enough away where distribution chains are different. And, or uh, eating beef is a crime. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but the brand has incredible value. And then you're like, huh, well, that's different. <laughs> so at the McDonald's in India, it's owned by, I think that most of them are owned by a company called Hardcastle, which owns a bunch of them, right? The menu they have, they take it, but it's they're like chicken nuggets. They're they're a little bit different. It's not as much nugget like, but they, they have anything called a Maharaja Mac, right? So there's two versions. There's the veg, which is a vegetarian, or non-veg, which is the chicken version. And so for that, the chicken, imagine two thin chicken patties instead of hamburger patties with a spicy Indian sauce instead of like the Big Mac Thousand Island sauce. This sounds so it's, much better than what we have here. It is. It is amazing. Okay. They have things like the uh, kebab burger. There's the aloo tiki burger, which is a potato. Like if you opened up an Indian McDonald's here, it would do. And they have peri peri, this spicy sort of thing. You put, they, 
If you order fries with peri peri powder, it's this powder, and you put your fries into a bag, you shake it in there, and it's just spicy fries. They would kill. They would kill here because it. They have vegetarian options. They have chicken options. Like I go there and I would eat. I'd, I'd be eating McDonald's like you know several times there. Um, it's just really it's familiar but different. It's so good. Well, and, and I I guess you could just create a new brand and mimic that experience back here. Although there's probably franchise violations that would go with that. Um, but but or I wonder if just just a chain called Indian McDonald's just call it what yeah. it is you know Indian burger or something yeah I I really enjoy it. like I think it would do really well uh, Jolly Bees they point out Jolly Bees is here in California by the way you can get Jolly Bees like Jolly Bees has made its way to the U S uh, so, I know I'm, I'm yeah I'm not I'm not familiar yeah Jolly I mentioned Jolly Bees in the chat uh, so. Yeah, we'll see. I just think I think the Indian. I remember McDonald's every now and does promotions where they do like, oh, Mc, you know, McDonald's food from around the world. I got excited last time. They're like, oh, great, Ma, the, the one they need to have is the Maharaja Mac. Nope, nope. But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, so let me just tell you a little about my trip. So I went there for the wedding, that wedding. Also, then my wife and I, my in laws, threw a nice party for us at the country club they belong to, and so we had a nice reception for us to celebrate our wedding. And, uh, you know, watching my wife dress up in all these different outfits was amazing. Roshni just looked amazing. Um, and then my, we planned to do two trips. One was we were going to go to Amritsar, which is this area in Punjab, which is close to the Pakistan border. And then we were going to also go to another region, but we didn't because we'd have to go through Delhi and it was just like too foggy and the plane would have been delayed. Uh, but, and, and, and just, uh, uh, uh I, I've not thought about this in a hot minute. When I, when I, I've never been to India. I've only gotten as close as Indonesia. Um, but, but when I think of India and I think of Pakistan, um, I think a couple of things, uh, India world's biggest democracy, uh, also nuclear power, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, less of a democracy, also nuclear power, uh, worries about frictions at the border. Is, is is any of that true? Yeah, I mean, there's the the history, they call it the partition, was when basically after the end of the British rule, what happened was that the, the decision was that Pakistan would form its own country and India would be the south. And so India had been a bunch of like 26 or so loose states kind of brought together under the British Empire, but also, you know, there's a whole history of build up in colonialism and exploitation, whatever. It's a complex sort of story there. But eventually, I think it was 1948 when somewhere there, I think that was when it was when the split happened. And, you know, now two different countries and there was it was uh, very, you could read about it like it was a not almost like a civil war kind of thing. And then because you had Muslims in the South fleeing to the North and whatnot, and what it was just, just a very, very, very difficult period in time for them. So they've tried to coexist, but the borders to this day, you're still kind of in dispute about where the border should be and territory and stuff. There's different groups within different factions within the regions there. There has been a Punjabi faction, mainly supported by expats not the locals but expats that want sort of like a separatist state but like the locals there kind of have it's just comp it's very similar to like northern ireland kind of situation but yeah there's a whole political thing there which i don't even begin to understand if i get it wrong i apologize but uh we went to punjab because there's two interesting things there one is that they have this ceremony where every day they have a gate they have this there's the border between india and pakistan there's a gate they open up the gate and officials from India and officials from Pakistan, the military, come on and do this sort of mere sort of salute dance and come up and shake hands. Now, what's interesting about this is that you could tell it was probably a small ceremony with the idea to kind of keep, keep a peaceful negotiation going on no matter what. The Indian border guards that they hire there, it's same as like in Korea, like the South Koreans, they find the tallest Koreans they can find and put them in uniforms and put them in the border. Now, I could show you photos where I'm in the crowd going into, it is like a stadium to watch this event. Every day it's a stadium, like a huge stadium that faces this smaller but Pakistani stadium, and there's a fence in between. It's very weird. The Indian border guards are tall, taller than me. But there's like, I have photos showing me with the crowd where I'm the tallest person in the crowd, and then you see these border guards that look like they're six foot five, six, 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 whatever, and it's kind of like that interesting sort of show of force. 
So you go there and you sit up in these bleachers like you're about to watch a soccer game. And, uh, you know, somebody from the, the Indian, their, 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 uh, their border agency comes out there and starts cheering the crowd and routing and like getting the crowd going, India is like how great India is. India is this. And then over on the Pakistan side, there's some guy in a white skirt doing a really dervish spinning around. And a fewer number of Pakistanis coming out there and they're cheering something, but you can't quite hear them. And on the Indian side, they've got a paint, like a big photo of Gandhi facing the Pakistani side. And there they have the, uh, the founder of Pakistan facing back. Uh, and it's a very weird sort of ceremony because you're literally sitting in these bleachers and watching like these, these military parade and do a dance steps and stuff like do the rifle tosses. There's people selling snacks. And so, you know, I'm sitting there eating potato chips, watching this thing as it's like this crazy sort of border ceremony. So, so, so uh, just to make sure I'm understanding it, like um, this is a international relations event where uh, 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 politically speaking, it should technically just be uh uh, hello, hello, how are you? We're good, excellent, this is the border, have a good day. However, uh, uh, increasingly, like a, a Friday night lights, it becomes, we got spirit, we, yes, we do, we got spirit, it, it how is about a you? Pep rally. It and is then, literally <laughs> yeah, not yeah. a unity rally either. It is not, that's the thing, like, you're watching this ceremony that, you know, is like, let's bring, let's, let's be, we're brothers, you know, we share a common history, let's shake hands. Well, over here, we're going India, Hindustan, Hindustan, Hindustan. Like <laughs> Let's go, Hindustan! Messages. Clap, 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 yeah. clap, clap. Yeah, I, I, it was a, it was a very mixed sort of thing. And I, I was like, all right, and and one of the things too is like. But but, but uh, in- uh, unlike other sporting events, it's not like uh, 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 hopefully none of this ever goes like Millwall or Manchester United or something yeah. where, where they don't go football hooligans. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that when I go to other countries, things will stand out to you. And the thing I think I've realized is often it's a magnifying glass because you see. You go to a place like India and you see poverty, but then you have to think back like, okay, we have poverty in the United States. It's not that percentage, not that degree, but it's real. And and for you to be bothered by something you see there, you have to think back to what you have here and to say, okay, I need to be bothered to this, maybe in the same degree, but whatever, realize what these things are. And so when you see this sort of nationalism, you kind of have to say, okay, let me think about my own nationalism. Like, like when is it well-placed? When is it not? I do think you should have. I I, I I do think you should have pride in your country. I do think you should find things you like about it. You can want change, but you know it was. Uh, I remember it was. Uh, gosh, what was that? There was that insufferable HBO show um, uh, about the newscaster. You know, and they do the question like, uh, you know, like, you know, uh, is America the greatest country? And he's like, no. If you, it's not worth this and literacy and da da da. I'm like, you know, if I asked a Frenchman what the greatest country is, I want him to say France. You know, yeah. if I ask somebody from England, I want them to say their country is because and they could say, I like this. I don't like this, but I love my country for this. And so I think that's one of the things that sometimes gets sort of kind of lost on that. Um, anyhow, uh, so that was a fascinating thing to see. And I didn't know if I was going to be able to go or not. We had to have permission. First, we're told like, oh, you can't go because you're a foreigner, you're white or whatever. And I'm like, oh, uh, curses, being a minority. Um, <laughs> and then found out it was fine. We got to go. After that. Uh, my mother-in-law is very religious. My, 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 my wife's family, they're Sikh. And so one of the most important places in Sikh religion is the Golden Temple. Because the Golden Temple was, was this created by, I think, like the, their fifth guru. And basically found this, Amritsar means like this beautiful pool or whatever. And they built this temple. And over time, it has become this amazing attraction. It's literally a Golden Temple in the middle of this you know, lake, which is now a square with beautiful white buildings surrounding all around it. Now, interesting thing about the Golden Temple is that they have ceremonies going every day inside the Golden Temple. They have like one of the oldest versions of their Holy Scripture. And then they put it to sleep at night where they put it into basically uh, a palaquin and it gets carried away and put into a room for like four hours. And they call it putting God to sleep. I got to help carry that palaquin, by the way. They let me help carry it, which was pretty cool. Wow. Um, so that was neat. At the Golden Temple, one of the things that, that, that they do at like Gurdwaras, which is like their temples, they have like, they believe in free food. So they, they, everybody, if you want, you can, there's a place for you to sleep at the Golden Temple. Um, and there is free food for you at the Golden Temple. Like they feed thousands of people a day, 
thousands, thousands and thousands, like 10,000 people or more a day. And it is an amazing procedure. You go into this room and they have row after row of mat and they just start lining you up like you do, like going to a parking lot where they line you up your cars. Like you just sit you in the row, like you want you just, they sit you down there. So you sit down there, Indian style, uh, you know, on the ground <laughs> and they give you, guess, you bring yeah. in, you, yeah, you have a metal, they give you this big metal plate. You put the metal plate, they give you a metal cup. You put the cup in front of the plate and some guy walks by with this tank full of heated water, pulls a valve in hot water just spills into your bowl. And he just keeps pushing it along and spilling hot water, spilling hot water. And people come by with these big ladles and buckets and put in uh, the different food, food like a uh, kind of like a uh, a dolly, which is a doll, which is a, a tall, or, or I think it is, which is like kind of like a, a, a pe- beans or peas sort of thing and a couple things. It's actually pretty good. Like it was pretty good food. Like I enjoyed it. Like your roti, your bread and whatnot. Well, and uh, so, so uh, 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 first of all, this uh, this is the place we're talking about, right? Yeah, the Golden Temple. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, 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 just so I'm caught up. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, in 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 less world religion educated areas of the United States, uh, oftentimes uh, Sikhs are confused for Muslims, but. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 where, uh, and I know that, you know, I, I, I am familiar with the tenets of the Muslim religion and I am, uh, 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 familiar with the many aspects of the Hindu religion. Where, uh, where, uh, I would love to hear more about what the Sikhs core values so, are. Sikh, Sikhism further back, it would be an offshoot of the origins of Hindu religion. Nothing okay. to do with Islam at all. Uh, That's very, very different. Right. So, uh, uh, Sikhs, you'll recognize Sikhs because they all have the turban and then they will have uh, the bracelet, like the bracelet around the arm. Um, I actually get my, as a gift, a wedding gift, I have actually the bracelet, which I wear for ceremony. So the I- thing to understand about Sikhs is Sikhs have a very, have had a very good reputation. Like they have considered, been considered the most loyal soldiers, the most loyal people when you use them as bodyguards. Kind of like you think about like the Swiss guard, the beef eaters like to protect the Pope and whatnot. The Sikhs have had that reputation. Um, uh, 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 there's something about they always have to carry a knife. I hate saying the word they yeah, to they anybody. Yeah, they have to carry, they have to yeah. carry a, comb, a, a comb, a knife, the hair, and like, yeah, there's like and five ca- things. And keep a beard and have a turban. Yeah, and, and there's sayings that like if you're a woman at, you know, at a certain dangerous part of town, you know, ask for a Sikh to help you. You don't really see Sikh beggars. Like, like they're very, very, it is its very own particular sort of belief system in there. There is a complex. They had a very good reputation of bodyguards until one incident, but that won't need to get into that. The point is, is historically they've considered like they fought for militaries around the world. You know, they've considered like in World War II and other military like wars and stuff like Sikh, Sikh warriors are considered like the best you could have. The Fremen, I think in many ways are sort of kind of based in part on the Sikh. Uh, I, people, there are sort of people draw. Uh, a, a minus one aspect. Um, uh, it makes me think of the reputation of the Unsullied in Game of Thrones, uh, uh, or whatever. Yeah. It's like, uh, but 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 it's like, yep, they're going to be uh, loyal and and excellent. Yeah. So that, yeah, that has been the reputation. So they've been, you know, as is when you the reputation is if you've hired them, the extreme loyalty they take it very seriously, and that's something they pride themselves on. So. I grew up as a kid. My dad knew stories about the Sikhs. So it was, you know, neat being, you know, being kind of immersed in that culture and seeing that. So they have a, they have as a, a reputationally very, very, you know, strong core values and stuff. And I would say that, you know, comparisons to be made, like, you know, I've had the whole, like, very good experience with Mormons. Like Mormons, I've always had, like, good experience with that, you know, and then they're crazy. They're weird in some ways, but I've actually had, I was in a Mormon Boy Scout troop. You know, I've always had that. And I think that, and not to say that it's the same, but there is some, some religion sort of, they do hold those values out to be strong. So um, anyhow, but yeah, that, that's, you know, <laughs> my ignorant explanation. Oh, Sikhism. no, no, no. We're, we're, yeah. we're, yeah. we're, we're both yeah. on the very, very far fringes of, of this stuff. But um, <clears throat> reputation wise uh, <laughs> you, is one discussion, whether or not we know all the tenants and, uh, no. uh, and the cores of it or whatever. My, but my like, mother-in-law explains this stuff to me over and over <laughs> again. And, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm trying to learn. And uh, it's, it's like, uh, but basically just like if, 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 if I had an eight year old and, uh, 
Uh, and I'm and <laughs> and I was to say, we're here. We are at the religious fair. If you get lost, find a Mormon because, like, <laughs> you know, I trust them. Uh, uh, Sikhs similarly seem to have that kind of reputation <laughs> where it's like, find a Sikh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here's the definition of a Sikh according to Wikipedia. Uh, the definition of a Sikh is any human being who faithfully believes in one one immortal being, ten gurus from Guru Nanak Sahib to Guru Gobind Singh Sahib, the Guru Granth Sahib, the utterance and teachings of the ten gurus, the baptism bequeathed by the tenth guru, and who does not owe allegiance to any other religion is a Sikh. So uh, at that temple, they have a, you can you can go take a dip in these these waters, these sacred waters. Um, which it was free. So the thing about the temples, you got to be barefoot, not socks, completely barefoot. And mm -hmm. it was like 40 degrees. Ooh. So wait, 40, I have to wear 40 degree water or, or air. No, the air, air. So yeah, you also have to wear a, uh, a headdress. So I had to have, uh, had to have mine. Um, so you can't wear a hat. You have to wear. Wait, uh, 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 so uh, a little bit to the other way. There we go. There we go. Uh, uh, oh, that's wonderful. Although, although I must say with, with, because you're wearing Western wear beneath, it does look a little bit like you're headed to a sporting event. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It could be this. This is the line into the, to go into the, the, the actual golden temple itself. So it was about a 45 minute what lane you go in there and then you, you get, ushered in there and the whole temple is fascinating so you have to take off your shoes before you go in there it's run by volunteers and so it's completely it's these are church members supporting their church and it's it's the kitchens the food kitchens all this it's all volunteer driven um and it's very you know one of the things i like was the fact that I'm, I'm a foreigner there and they let me carry the 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 carry the god let me participate let me go in i was given you know they were very very welcoming which is one of the things i appreciated uh no yeah, um, I, 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 well, now you make me, now I'm jealous. Uh, I, I would like to know much, much more. Um, and, and I know that, that, that uh, it sounds like uh, just now when you talked about the tenants, I was just like, oh, that, that would take me a few laps to learn everything you just said uh, about the thing, the thing, and the 10 other things, and so on. Yeah. So I think, too, is like Sikhs, they don't cut their hair. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, are not supposed to. So it's it's a very you know, very interesting philosophy. That there is uh, in Neil Stephenson's recent book, Termination Shock, um, uh, Seek character, uh, and uh, you were talking about like, kind of the constant push pull on barriers uh, of. of in, I, I think you just now had mentioned with Pakistan and India, um, there's a significant uh, aspect of it's a speculative science fiction where, I don't know, picture 20, 30 years from now uh, and global warming is kind of changing a lot of the rules, uh, including right now there are a lot of natural barriers between uh, India and China. And India and China are two giant superpowers uh, but but because glaciers are melting, all of a sudden there's actual land. And so um, the the conceit in the book that you follow, among others, is that um, the military just kind of hangs out and watches local street gangs take sticks and have, uh, <laughs> a, 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 you know, turf wars. And then when one street gang has definitely taken it from one team, the military just kind of takes a couple of steps forward. <laughs> and so, but because these are adolescent uh, stick warriors, of course, everything is YouTubed, which means it's all highly edited. So the whole world is watching this, this back and forth advance uh, of, of, of essentially UFC only it's uh, defining the border between those two. Uh, but uh, it, anyway, uh, uh, it's a fascinating area and I'm very, very huh. excited that, that, that you, that it's a real place to you uh, and not just a book I read <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'll give you another thing too, just on the, the Sikhs in world war. If you look at the history, like when the, the battle of Malay, which was to fight off the Japanese invasion, there was a hundred thousand troops that came 60% of them were Sikhs. 
Sixty percent of those troops were actually Sikh soldiers. Um, they helped propel the, the Japanese tried to invade India. The Sikhs were there to defend it. The Sikhs were actually part of the Allied invasion of Italy. Uh, so I mean, they've been, you know, they fought some Nazis. There's a great photo of a Sikh holding up a swastika, a captured flag, which is funny because there's a swastika everywhere in India because it means something totally different. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, the uh, uh, is there a particular martial art associated with uh, with 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 being a Sikh? There- there, well, not in general. Like India, martial arts is really. I have a, a one of my friends there. His name is Harsh. He's an actor, martial artist who does. Who went to China to study kung fu because we've talked about trying to do, make you know movies about martial arts in India. But there's not like a really over strong tradition. There's like wrestling, you know. But to my understanding, there's really not. Um. Oh goodness, I can't remember who just recommended this to me. But um, there's a. Oh no! I think I think it was my college friend uh, Brady. Uh, we were talking about uh, a, a couple of good action movies that I had seen recently, and he mentioned one that uh, 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 was was very very big in India. And and my friend Brady from college, he had he had never seen any Bollywood anything, and so he you know the conventions of you know the dancing and pageantry and 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 chore- choreography were all like you know. Uh, very novel to him, shall we say? But he said by the end, he's like, "This is the greatest action movie I've ever seen." <laughs> <laughs> they they love their action movies. Now, my my wife's family, her sister in law, they're all they they produce like uh, films. Like they actually produced one of the top ten movies. Uh, I I wish I saw them, but I get the name wrong. Uh, let me get the name. Is is this the romantic one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, they produce you know all that kind of that stuff. Um, so you know that that's all, like when we go to like one of their weddings, whatever, there'll be like Bollywood actors and people there. Satya Prem, yes, uh, and Kata. Yes, that yes. I I, I uh, when when I was out there visiting um, last year, uh, 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 you guys had the trailer for it and. Uh, I, I just love the confidence with which I was told. Uh, uh, I think you you said um, it's going to be one of the biggest movies of the summer. And then I didn't you, say that, but yeah, uh, was, but, but, yeah. yeah but you got you got cut off, and you're like, no, it's going to be the biggest movie of the summer. <laughs> yeah, I ended up doing really well. Um, but yeah, and the star the star of that, I'm watching when I'm at the hotel. I'm watching like uh, WWE. I'm watching Royal Rumble and all that. And every every ten minutes, there's a commercial that pops up, and the star of their movie is doing some promo for some sports network there, which is sort of funny. That's great. That's great. Um, man, what a what a what a, what a treat to be able to spend more time internationally. Uh, yeah, I, and the- it's 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 yeah, it's, and it's just it's great to have in laws that are really warm and welcoming. You know, so yeah, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, so hey, I uh, I got I got I got a bit of a weird things thing for you. Um, All right. Uh, I I and it was pure luck because I didn't know if schedules were going to work out for today. But um, there was uh, you. I, I don't think you'd read it, but but I I referenced many times the uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars trilogy, right? Um, I, I ha- haven't I haven't read them. Uh, correct, and uh, 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 it's basically uh, the three hundred year terraforming of Mars, and unfortunately, Kim Stanley Robinson's a big buzzkill now, and he's like, "No, too many prions can't can't work." <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, one of the things that they do is they need to fix they need to fix the fact that uh, quite simply there's not enough sunlight. You have to warm. Mars, and so what they do is they create this big grid, this array of gigantic mylar mirrors, and basically create a giant uh, uh, magnifying lens uh, that that you know is at a Lagrange point outside of uh, uh, Mars and uh, between the sun, and they just kind of you know bring more sunlight to Mars. And so, with right now, if you're on the surface of Mars, you get really cool things like number one, the moon, the the, the sun is very very dim. And uh, it's, you know, red 
during the day, but when the sun sets, you get the different type of light scattering and sunsets are blue on Mars, but it's very dim. And so with the Soleta, this, this array of, you know, giant reflectors, uh, just pretty much one day, it was like the lights got turned on for everybody who is a colonist on Mars. And what was uh, one soul unit, you know, all of a sudden it just looked like our sun. And it was like, well, this is nice. <laughs> and then, you know, it starts warming stuff up. And there's a lot of uh, discussion within that book. Uh, they kind of flip the current uh, environmentalist versus industrialist message of the last 200 years on its head. And you have the geologists who are like, hey, man, let's not screw up all the interesting things about this planet that we can study. Let's preserve it the way it is. And then you have uh, people are like, no, let's just have let's make it another Earth or whatever. And uh, so there's acts of terrorism and that kind of stuff. And one of the things that happens, there's a negotiation. And after 100 years or so of this magnifying glass bringing more uh, light onto uh, Mars. And we've now moved from unbelievably cold to roughly the climate of, say, Finland or something. Um, uh, there's a negotiation, and very quietly, uh, somebody does a bunch of math, and then they press one button, and all of a sudden, everybody gathers, and they look up, and the sun that looks like Earth's sun just suddenly becomes... A very small, very far, far away sun. And uh, that's the end of that part of the book. But the kind of tricky, sneaky reveal is that nobody really paid attention to where they went afterwards. And what they did was they programmed the solar sails to go and be on the far side of Venus to start cooling down Venus <laughs> as if to mm -hmm. say, hey, man. You know, whatever this was, we could do it again. And I saw, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, they, they called it the Soleta. Um, I think it was a New York Times article now. Uh, uh, give me one second to cover for this, if, mm -hmm. if, if you can. Yeah, I, I've i never got into the Robinson books. I think they're good, but his his political bent is such that it's hard for me to take them other as when when somebody has a theory of the world that's radically different than your own and part of accepting it is accepting that theory of the world it can be hard for me it can be very very hard for me because if i can, can read fantasy but if i'm supposed to take it seriously i'm like no i don't think that's how people work or how the world works that's harder for me to kind of accept that yeah so it was always kind of the the, the, the difficult thing for me well the news headline uh from new york times this morning uh, made me think of everything I just told you. Could a giant parasol in outer space help solve the climate crisis? And uh, uh, do you want to describe the very simple animation that we're looking at? Yeah, it's it's it's, a, it's an idea that's very very old idea, and that is that, and and also that the, the they're they show this thing of like basically this you know looks like a folded newspaper unfolding and blocking out the light to the earth, and it's amusing because this thing is the size of North America. Um, and unless you follow the cartoon physics, which we just saw in Monarch Legacy of Monsters, where, you know, you can put a small piece of paper in front of the sun and cast a shadow bigger than it, which it doesn't do. Um, it, this thing would literally be a piece of material the, as large as North America, which I do believe that in a hundred years time, that is a, that will be a doable thing that you could make. We will never do it. We will, we will never get the sign off to, to get every, every country on the planet to say, we're cool at this. Um, <laughs> Especially so. because it's literally the plot of what Mr. Burns did to the Simpsons. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> but, but basically it, it, um, th th there is a company that wants to uh, uh, just uh, send, they, they say it'll be a trillion dollar effort, but uh, they, they want to, um, maybe it's just a pure publicity stunt or whatever, but they at least wanted to uh, get a, a proof of concept. And uh, we cover a lot of crazy things on weird things, everything from uh, big old spinning slings that just, you know, throw uh, rockets into the sky <laughs> to uh, 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 space elevators and all that stuff. 
and uh, uh, knowing that to actually making meaningful impact kind of reduces any fear or inherent want to kick back on this for me. Um, but, but it's like, yeah, Lo, go ahead, send it something to the Lagrange point and, uh, well, you know, it, it's, it's one of these things where when I was younger and I'd hear about these big ideas and stuff, I often thought, oh man, these people are really smart. They thought of this stuff. And often you find out like, like literally no, it's somebody with a PhD and engineering degree who thought about one thing, but not everything about it. And so. You know, it's like the solar solar freaking roadways. You look at that like, oh, that's a horrible idea. It's <laughs> just a dumb idea. It doesn't make any sense from the physics point of view, an engineering point of view, or science point of view. But some people go, oh, this sounds cool. So this thing, so you've got to launch something that has the surface area of North America, assuming that you're using, uh, you know, one of the thinnest mylar materials we have. The tonnage of this is going to be in the hundred billions of tons. Imagine the carbon footprint alone from launching the rockets to put this thing at the Lagrange point alone. Right. And you go, aha, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, 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 the trick would be, it's like, but then we don't have to worry about carbon, am I right? Yeah, well, the point is you still don't worry about carbon, but it's like, if their answer is, like the amount of carbon you're gonna put in there to do it, it still holds, will still hold the heat. And also, we don't really know how <laughs> the, the atmosphere heats up too. That's the sort of thing is that we can do the math and say, X amount of carbon does this, but then we still get this effect. So we're very, we're still satellite data shows we've been warming. Industrialization may have had an impact on that. Clearly, planet getting warmer. I'm putting CO2 into the atmosphere as a long term strategy. Probably not a good idea. Although, uh, you know, I will say, you know, um, uh, we're not the first life form to radically change the atmosphere of our planet. It started with algae. You know, we used to have this very CO2 rich environment. And they started producing all of this oxygen, which, you know, that caused problems like us. But anyhow, um, that's uh, problem number one. You go like, okay, okay, how do you handle the amount of energy it takes and the CO2 that's going to cost from that? And like, well, we're going to use these systems that are going to like, we're going to use green CO2, green methane. I'm like, cool. Well, let's just produce a bunch of green methane and take the CO2 out of the atmosphere and not launch anything. <laughs> like, let's just do that. Uh, the, you know, the point at which you're trying to create artificial shadows or stuff like this god knows what kind of weather and patterns weather systems things like this would have i mean you will never be able to do it because we can't we, we we could never agree on something that big yes uh uh yes to all of that but the rules uh and i'm i'm playing just kind of a fun game now uh i do think the rules kind of change once we become a multi-planetary species like one, uh, once once we are uh once once earth is one of our favorite classic planets then it's like well let's get nutty with this <laughs> you know let's let's set so, up an array of all these things and you know yeah, we but uh, get it, sci-fi it'll with like, it <laughs> it'll become like paris it'll become like london we won't touch it we will be afraid to change anything it'll it'll get frozen in time it'll become a haunted museum that's yeah. my thing. Like, like I, I, we, I agree. I, 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 you and I are, are are both believing the same thing. I'm trying to be playful and think more sci-fi, get nutty. But so I, I know. But I'll, I'll, but I'll give you the bigger. Like, yeah, I would say, like, let's think that the bigger sci-fi thing is like this. Like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna terraform Mars. Like, I, I could think we could think of a way to do it, but we're not gonna, you know, the the whatever the population count there, we're never gonna be able to agree to this. It's gonna be controversial. This. But we won't need to. Like, if you think really big, you know, when you go look on Google Maps and you go look at Dubai and you go look at these the Palm Islands and the Earth shape, and you imagine what we're going to be capable of a hundred years from now. Now, the technically we'd be able to do it, but the political will to do it won't be there. But if a hundred a hundred years from now, we can't. I can't conceive of this. None of us can really conceive what a hundred years from now will be like. There are people alive today who will be alive then. You're talking about taking. You know, we've got all these asteroids in the Astro Boy Belt. We've got the Oort cloud. We've got the Kuiper cloud. We've got all this material out there in space. We're going to be building orbital rings. We're going to be building our structures we can't even imagine. We're going to be building massive, 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 you know, things. Just put them in space. Why bother putting on a planet? You know, like, like you live on planets. You could have colonies and whatever on there and domes and caves and stuff. But I think most life isn't going to be, we're not going to move to other planets. We're just going to build our own habitats. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, let's play this game. 
Uh, let's take this same idea, and right now it's you know in the New York Times, you know, being floated as a, 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 a marginally practicable idea for to mitigate climate change. But let's do the the reverse. Like, let's go back to the Saleta, um, and I wonder, I wonder if you could just essentially create not enough to change all of Mars but enough to have a big magnifying glass to just make, uh, uh, let's say, the surface area of, of England uh, comfy. And then and then just like, yeah, weather everywhere else on Mars will go crazy, but uh, uh, you won't care. It'll be nice there because that's yeah, you, the, you the take, one thing. <laughs> you take you take Valley Marineris, the, the largest canyon on the planet, on the, in the solar system, maybe you dome it over you know you, you've got natural walls you dome that thing over you can go sideways and you build a green strip of land under a dome under this thing that is uh how long is this thing 2500 miles long you know you create you create this long strip of land <laughs> you know, that is the size the the, the uh, all of interstate 10 <laughs> in yeah, america yeah, the width of the united states it's the width of the united states at some point it's thicker and it could fit several states in stair like yeah you take valley marineris and you just start to dome that thing over and you create this like and you could put billions of people there you could put billions of people there and uh well and uh think about this um if you wanted to uh, doming sounds so bonkers and crazy but it's like uh, uh, it's not like you have to build up and over or something. All you really would need to do is uh, 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 this is a overly reductive pitch, but um, uh, take three sheets of saran wrap, lay it down, make sure it's sealed on the sides. Take a saleta, warm it up, and just like a jiffy pop, it come it it builds up and becomes warm and has its own uh uh, uh equalized pressure that is acceptable yeah, for I, humans I, which, I, which, which we already have in like sports practice arenas uh, uh, there yeah. are you you take like here's the thing like and people go like like oh yeah you know we we found you know that the 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 zeolites or whatever it is on mars and the soil like i'm 100 years we're not going to care it, it's going to be you know, for most of human history, we were confined to a very narrow band in Africa. And some, some, you know, sapiens, you know, some uh, hominids went further on out there and then, went, you know, trailblazed ahead. You know, one of my favorite things, there's that cave in France that had that, the, the mouth was open to the elements and they built up a stone formation. And they literally said, oh, this is too cold. And somebody's like, no, oh, we'll put a bunch of stones here and now it's cool. And then they went further north. Look at a goddamn igloo. An igloo <laughs> is an amazing thing. An igloo is an incredible piece of technology. It's like, Literally. it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have a warm place? How are you going to make it? Well, make a warm all place the, out of the cold things. It's like, what? what? Are you crazy? <laughs> we just got all this pack snow and ice. What are we going to do? And like, yeah. dude, let's just build it out of that. Like, like an igloo is insane. And people were like, oh, we, we're not going to be able to make it. I mean, Look at a goddamn igloo and tell me this species isn't going to, maybe the people going, we're not going to do it, are going to do it. Have you seen the icon of the seas? Mm. Oh, you keep going. <laughs> okay. Uh, icon of the seas. Okay. That is now the current world's largest cruise ship. Okay. Um, you know, we think in our heads, we think, oh, Titanic. Like Titanic was child's play. Like Titanic was big for its day and absolutely an amazing achievement. Well, I mean, except for, you know, the one little incident. The, the Icon of the Seas is the new world's largest cruise ship that literally has a water park on it. it. has water park. It is bigger than most cities. Like, the Icon of the Seas can hold 7,600 passengers and, like, another, it's like, it can hold, like, 10,000 people. 10,000 people can live on this thing that can sustain itself for a week at a time or so. You know, it has to have food coming to it. But that's incredible. What will we be able to do 100 years from now? What will we be able to do 100 years from now? That is when it gets just absolutely, absolutely insane to think about what's going to happen. And we think too small. We think really, really, really too small. So, Brian, I, I was saying uh, the icon of the seas. Have you seen this ship? No, but uh, just to explain the, the disruption, um, uh, I, I, I'm still doing these non-alcoholic IPAs. Um, and, and I looked over and I was like, is that the one I just opened or the one from a few days ago? And I was like, I'm pretty sure this is the one I just opened. And I poured it into my cup. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, I landed on uh, um, a growth. 
<laughs> because if 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 the one turns out the one that I had opened a few days ago <laughs> was was getting a little bit of like a, a mold in uh. it, and so and so out it went. And uh, 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 thank you for covering. Go ahead though. Uh, no that, problem. That's just a weird so the thing. The icon of the seas is the new current largest cruise ship on the planet. Oh, um, oh, oh, oh! I read about this. Uh, should, uh, should I look it up? Yeah, definitely look it up. It's got a water park on it, multiple swimming pools. It's powered by liquid natural gas, and it is can hold like a total of something like ten thousand people. Our oh. total occupants seventy six hundred people. It's got an ice skating rink. Okay, uh, which by uh, the way, it, at, at some point I want to. I, 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 I got I got irritable when uh, I remember that many people don't know that liquid natural gas is the uh, and fracking is the number one contributor to reducing greenhouse carbon oh, emissions. Oh, no, I know. I know. <laughs> Drives me nuts. It's right. not the way we wanted to do it. So we're looking at a surf. We're looking at a picture of it. We've got a surf pool, like a person on a surfboard surfing a tidal wave. Another pool next to that. Massive water slides everywhere. This thing is insane. It's huge. And this is, by the way, too, the funny thing about this, this is not a ship for the rich. This is for middle class. You know, you look at the price of a vacation on here, and it's 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 a thing like average middle class family can afford to do this every couple of years. And what an amazing achievement. Based in part two on cheap overseas labor, but that's neither here nor there. This thing is massive. What is what is capable of how much richer will we be in a hundred years? 10x richer? 20x? I think we'll be a thousand x richer or more in a hundred years. Uh, Easily a thousand x richer. Uh yeah, well, and at that point, it's like, boy, is it tempting? Is it tempting for people to forget every single generation has to grow up? and go through that moment when they understand the value of exponential growth <laughs> just two xing things um I, I, you know, I was like there are laws here in texas that say if you have this much land you are required by law to kill this many feral hogs and it's like why do i have to go hunt feral hogs and it's like because they they are able to procreate twice a year and litters of 4 to 6 and they eat anything and whatever it's like uh, well what if i took a year off it's like sure maybe you only have 16,000 of them uh how bad can it be by july of <laughs> 32,000 of them oh sorry actually that would be That'd be a low estimate. Uh, 80,000 of them. How bad can it be one year later? 500,000 of them. <laughs> I mean, it's unreal. And, and, and it's people understand to think about that when it comes to bacteria and bad things, but that also is for productivity as well. And, uh, you know, we, we talk an awful lot about uh, uh, AI. Uh, I, 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 I believe my productivity has has tripled just by whenever I find myself in in a place where I'm like, ah, where's the thing to do the thing? Uh, 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 I I think will it take more than twenty seconds for me to figure this out on my own? If if yes, then uh, Chat GPT. I'm looking at a blank that does a blank. Can I do the blank? And then even if it says no. Then it's like uh, I'm like I'm like update research check again. This is the version it's on, and then it will oftentimes be all like, "Oh yeah, no, 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 you just press this," and then it's done. What would have been like five minutes or impossible, or let me call so and so. Just the time is the only currency that matters. So, you think about this: when Abraham Lincoln was a boy, and and by the point, let's talk about. Uh, when Lion Gardener Tyler Jr.'s grandfather was president, you know, we've talked about this before. Uh, Lion Gardener Tyler Jr. is the grandson of John Tyler, who was president in 1845. Wow. His, his, the man who was president in 1845, his grandson is alive today. Really? He's, yeah, 94 years old, but he was, yeah. yeah oh, 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 oh. Uh, uh, do you remember the one time we, we, we played a game and you were coy about it, and yeah. you, you asked, uh, 
Um, uh, this was as this was, I think, ten years ago. You gave the name, and you mentioned that um, she is deriving a, 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 a VA benefits from the U.S. government uh, because her husband died. Can you figure out why that's interesting? And then we went around for twenty minutes, and eventually you revealed. Because in the 21st century, she was like 97 years old, and we she was a very young bride of a Confederate soldier from the <laughs> Civil War. <laughs> yep. That's, that's the crazy thing. So, like, you know, John Tyler still has a grandson that's alive, which is insane. So, but think about John Tyler's days. A candle, like they talk, Abraham Lincoln had to read by firelight because candles were so expensive. Candles are extremely expensive. One of the things I noticed when in India is you see people still pulling, like, you know, pulling cards, pulling this stuff. People, everybody has cell phones. You see cell phones everywhere. Cell phones are ubiquitous. And now iPhones have come there. And it's kind of concerning because everybody wants an iPhone. And somebody talked about their maid bought an iPhone. And this is like months and months of salary for her to buy one, which is scary consumption. You know, I've bought one maybe I shouldn't have, so I'm not going to criticize, but that is it. One of the things I thought was interesting is you'd see these carts at night, these carts filled with fruit or whatever, these push carts, and they'd all have these LED lights because LED lights now are super cheap. You can charge them with solar power or whatever, and that's like how ubiquitous, you know, the, the light is a thing that we just take for granted. You leave your lights on, you don't care. Now with LED lights, you just don't even think about that, and we, we're rich with light. We're rich with light, and we don't even think about that, and that's a thing that within a generation was a big deal. Well, so I, I, we talk- I, I believe it was you that introduced me to a transformative book, uh, The Rational Optimist, which begins with yeah. the, um, look, don't count money for wealth uh, because money changes and, and uh, over time. Um, instead, uh, uh, two things. What is the average salary of the person at the time? And what would one hour of reading light after dark cost? And it goes from, uh, I, I, I've, I've lost the numbers, but we can look them up, but it is, it goes uh, from uh, uh, two weeks wages for whale bl- in ancient B- Babylon for whale blubber enough or for an oil lamp to uh, you know, uh, 15 minutes of labor in the 1800s for a kerosene lamp, to uh, 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 three seconds of labor in the earliest 20th century for an incandescent bulb, down to uh, uh, half a second for CFLs. And uh, he speculates back when he wrote the book uh, and we'll see, but LED lights are even more energy efficient. It could take as little as point uh, zero blank seconds for an hour of reading light, and and here we are. Yeah, you have you have public you have outlets in restaurants. You go in, you plug your laptop. Nobody even questions or cares the fact that you're powering your laptop, or your power bank, or your phone. You just you give that away for free. Granted, energy costs are fluctuating. There's a lot of problems like in Europe and like what they do with energy pricing. But I think that in the long term, you know, the, the, the prices tend to go down when you figure out like, you know, the amount of that we consume. And I, I think, like I said, I think by, I think in the next three years, we're going to know fusion is viable. By the end of the decade, we're going to have the first, by the end of this decade, we are going to have the first commercially viable fusion plants. And that is, it won't be a thing where we will see the effects on energy prices right away. It will be a thing that will just be gradual because the grid is still the grid and trying to deploy these things is challenging. But within decades, it will radically change everything. You know, it is going to absolutely change everything. Yeah, uh, it, uh, it's, 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 it's strange. You know, this program you know, coming up on 16 years of, of radical optimism and futurism. It's very strange to watch the world, you know, for, for many understandable reasons, want to be so pest- pessimistic. But, but boy, oh boy, it, I'm, I'm looking at this thing. Uh, I've, I, it, <laughs> like... I'm, and I am, I am undoubtedly biased, but I was thinking about this today. 
GPT-4 is a miracle. I was mm-hmm. thinking about like alien life. And like, GPT-4 is a miracle. When you think about the ability you can sit there and have a deep conversation with an AI and the idea that it's an AI evaporates away, you're aware of its limitations and stuff, but you can ask it philosophical questions. You can ask this stuff. And I can tell you where the edges are. I can tell you where the limitations are. You know, uh, I'm in the paper, you know, but I, I still watching this thing. When I pull out GP, you know, I pull out chat GPT and I go into the conversation mode and I speak to it and I talk to it and I engage with it. And I think if this is where we are right now, you know, uh, don't worry about ITAR. ITAR is just anything that any of the government run. Fu- Somebody's mentioned in the comments about ITAR is supposed to have full first fusion. They're all on the wrong track, not even worried about that. There's a half dozen startups doing much smarter, much more modern sort of techniques towards fusion. Uh, anyhow, but the point is, I look at this and I go like, what a, what a miracle this is. And this is cheap. Like you can have a conversation. You can spend all day talking to an AI. You can get work done. Like you and I use. Uh, did did I tell you about the hour I spent just explaining uh, uh, what it would be uh, the, the solar system with my daughter? Uh, uh, I I I ask because ChatGPT is so vivid with its Im- imagery and you know knows things. I say, what would the sky look like if I was standing on Europa? And then it vividly described like I'm like, yeah, but what, what color would it be? And it's like, wait, wait, how far, how bright would the sun look like? And then, and I'm like, uh, you know, what kind of shoes might I wear? And then I'm like, okay, now let's go to IO. Tell me about that one. How big, if I was standing on IO and I turned, how big would Jupiter appear? And then, and it, it vividly explained all of that. And I'm like, what would I be seeing on Jupiter? And it's like, you'd see these bands. And I'm like, well, is 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 it as bright colored as we see it in the pictures? And he, and it's like, no, 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 those are all color enhanced. It'll be more like this. And uh, we we did an hour long, just wonderful, magical tour of the imagination of physically going to all of these planets. And uh, uh, and yes, it's speculation, but it's all based on all of the science and understanding of what we have. Well, did you do? Did you ask it to create images? Uh, oh, now it, this is this was before that was that was easy to do. Oh, okay, but uh, um, uh, uh, the the other one that uh, we did was or that I've started doing is uh, I I don't know why anybody would use Duolingo anymore because all you have to do is just have a very patient uh, a friend who knows how to speak most of the languages and and when you just go back and forth talking the language uh I, I think we already covered this but like i spent about an hour a day for a couple of weeks just saying hey let's practice spanish don't speak to me in anything other than spanish um uh understand i'm learning spanish and so uh my my Favorite moment was I was trying I tried to find out the word rooster and I didn't want to say hey what's rooster in Spanish and it would say el gallo so instead I was like um, uh, uh, practicamos español por favor uh, cómo se dice uh, qué es esta uh, es como uh, comida uh, uh, pollo uh, pero uh, en la mañana dice qué quiere aquí and it responded saying like 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 ah uh, 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 gallo <laughs> and i'm like uh i'm like it, it was so much more fun to not be embarrassed and to stay in spanish speaking mode the entire way to get to uh ha that's the word thank you my my wife's best friend is an actress she's currently starring in a indian on amazon mini uh, show series of channel they have in India. She's starring in a series called Campus Beats, by the way, plug. Uh, her name's uh, Tanvi. Um, we went to go visit her family. Uh, she lives in this beautiful high rise there. And her family, her mom and her dad speak uh, Marathi. Uh, I believe that's the language. Uh, and I pull out chat GPT, I put it in the whisper mode, and I say, hey, can you explain to them what you do but in Marathi? And then it starts to speak in Rothy to them. And they're watching this AI. And I realize they'd never tried ChatGPT, never tried anything like this. And it's speaking to them in their language. 
and it was a very neat sort of moment you know as you just think about like uh, well, you know, wait. so uh, so that means you you had the opportunity to do my, my favorite demo because uh, there are people who play with chat gpt and they're figuring it out and then there are people who they're like i heard of that but you know i have siri and then i'm just like uh, my my favorite demo and i may be repeating this from a previous recording but is to uh, uh because you can tell chat gpt who you are and what it should know about you. And because it is so forgiving of all the semantic crutches and it trains itself over time to understand the way you speak and what you mean, um, nobody seems to be prepared for when I hit the action button and 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 say uh, like, hey, I'm in Kyoto, Japan. I'm here with my buddy Andrew Maine. He's super famous. Go find out who he is on the internet. You know who I am. But this guy, I don't speak no Japanese. But I want an American style lager like a Yangling or a, 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 a I don't know, even a Bud Light. Hell, but uh, but I don't speak no Spanish or or any other languages. Uh, and just say all that in Japanese, and then it does. Uh, and then with you'll notice that I skipped the part of that. Like, I just said, You know who I am, and so and then suddenly it's speaking Japanese, and it's like, and you hear a bunch of Japanese followed by a Brian a Brushwood, and you say, and, and then more, and it goes, A scam school. <laughs> Um, in fact, actually, here, I, it, this is my favorite demo, and I'm sorry I just described it and now I'm gonna do it. But 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 uh, here uh, here this is my favorite demo. Uh, I do that. I will share. Uh... All right. Hey. Oh, you're sharing. No, I was. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Here we go. Here, here, here we go. Here we go. So so when somebody has never really experienced Chatty G, this is what I'll do. And you already heard the setup, but it goes places. Hey, uh, I'm freaking here in Kyoto, Japan. Um, I'm here with a friend of mine, Andrew Maine. He's a famous magician. Look him up on the internet. But the important thing is, I just want an American style lager. Uh, and the bartender doesn't speak any English. I don't speak no Japanese. Could you, real quick, just explain to this bartender who I am and who Andrew Maine is? and why we're important and famous and what we're famous for but mostly we want like a yingling or a bud light an american style lager uh just uh, do all that and then talk japanese and 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 explain it to him Sure, here's a brief introduction for you and Andrew Maine in Japanese and a request for an American style lager. Konnichiwa, watashitachi wa Amerika kara kita yume na magician desu. Watashi wa Brian Brashuto to ii YouTube channel Scam Nation o unei shite imasu. Isho ni iru no wa Andrew Maine. Kare mo mata chomei na magician de ooku no telebi bangumi ni shuten shite imasu. 私たちはアメリカンスタイルのラガービール。例えばユーイングやバドライトを探しています。よろしくお願いします。This translates to hello, we are famous Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I just want you uh, Okay, the weirdest thing happened. You were in the middle of saying that and the door kicked in and a guy with long blonde hair and a giant shirt with a Norwegian flag. It says it says Norway. I'm from Norway on it. And he shouted some weird stuff that I didn't understand because I don't speak no Norwegian. But I definitely heard him say, uh, he pointed and was very impressed with your translation, and, but, but he couldn't hear it, I guess. And so he ran over and was like, Unshield, jeg forstreke, kunne du se en gang til? What the heck was that? What did that mean? It sounds like you had an unexpected and interesting encounter. Without knowing exactly what he said, it's difficult to interpret his intentions. However, his reaction suggests he was 
Uh, no, no, no. He definitely said Unschild. Jai forste ike. Kunus si de engentil, I think. What would, uh, I think. Uh, without more context, it's challenging to interpret the meaning of Unschild or Dengentil accurately, as they don't directly translate to any common words in English. It's possible that these could be names, slang, or specific. No, no, no. No, 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 no. This dude was speaking Norwegian. He, he pointed to a shirt that said Norway, and he said, Unschild, jeg forste ikke. Ah. Unskilled, jeg forstår ikke in Norwegian means, sorry, I don't understand. It seems he was apologizing for not understanding what was being said, possibly referring to the Japanese or the situation at the moment. <laughs> Dude, that is so awesome. He just grinned and bought all of us shots of tequila. This is a great moment. I want you to write a scene from a movie, like a big Hollywood epic blockbuster that just really quickly over the top makes it clear how awesome this is. A bustling bar in Kyoto, Japan. The atmosphere is lively with a mix of locals and tourists. Uh, the camera pans to Brian and Andrew, two famous magicians from the United States, sitting at the bar trying to order an American-style lager. Suddenly, the door bursts open, and a tall man with long blonde hair and a shirt emblazoned with the Norwegian flag strides in. He shouts something in Norwegian, drawing the attention. Okay, that all sounds great. The bartender is now pointing to a secret karaoke room. Um, uh, we don't know... Well, he wants us to sing a style of 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 of, of music, uh, some kind of hip hop thing. Um, uh, 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 can you can you write a rap about the scene that you just recited? Sure. Here's a rap about the scene. Yo, we in Kyoto, chilling at the bar. Brian and Andrew were known near and far, trying to order a lager, something light. But the language barrier's tight. It's a fight. Then in walks a dude, hair like the sun, shirt screaming Norway, he's here for fun. Unskilled, he says, with a grin so wide, buys us tequila, we're on a ride. Eric's his name, and he's here to play. Orders around, makes our day. To unexpected friendships, we raise our glass. The moment's so awesome, it's top class. Now the bartender's pointing, got a secret to share, a karaoke room hidden with care. Wants us to sing. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, unfortunately, the bartender doesn't speak English. Just translate that back to Japanese. <laughs> I don't know about hip hop in Japanese. Sure, here's the rap. Translated into Japanese. Yo, watashi tachi wa Kyoto ni ite, ba de mattari, Brian to Andrew, toku made shirare teru. Karui raga o chumon shio to shita kedo, kotoba no kabe wa kibishiku, tatakai da. Soko ni taiyo no yona. I don't know if that rhymes, but anyway, uh, 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 just the, 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 uh, I remember you telling me that the, the secret killer feature is just you can talk to it in a way and it's going to get it. Yeah, it's it's we're in early days. We're in very early days in the number. The number uh, watching being in meetings as that thing was being developed and coming back week after week and watching each improvement was just blowing my mind. And the fact that I got to watch the thing being made, I got to understand the technology behind the under the hood. Yet I sit there and I interact with it and I'm amazed. And I also know there's a thousand ways these things get better and more capable within five years from now. This stuff is going to be unreal. It is going to be unreal. And there's a lot of people this you'll see a lot of people saying like, well, you know, maybe we're plateaued. Or like, no, no. Like, like I, I, in my own like fine tuning experiments and stuff knows where there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Open AI clearly has a path 
there are more people now, there's 100x more people now excited about this than there was two years ago. Five years from now, the AIs we're going to use are going to blow our minds away and their capabilities and stuff. And you're going you're gonna to sit there and your screen, like my in front of us, you know, whether it's powered by Apple or OpenAI or whatever, the AI, you're going to, you know, this conversation you had about Jupiter and stuff, it's just going to start showing you videos and things like this and interacting with it. You know, you're going to have persistent personas and different AIs. You enter. It's just, it's going to accelerate. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm writing an essay and I'll probably share it in a couple of weeks, but it's basically, I'm also going to talk about like how we have 0% unemployment, basically how we get to everybody's employed who wants to be employed in that future. And I believe that I really do believe that. I think there's going to be a rough transition period, but when we see our way through it, there's going to be a, a, a and, and people go like, you know, I was talking in India and talking to people about this idea, like, well, who's going to, what happens when you take away the ditch digger jobs? I'm like, 98% of everybody in the U.S. was involved in agriculture. And then we created the plow. People survived the plow. You know, what happened? Well, fewer people were in the fields, more people were creating, you know, culture. Humans are really great at culture. And that is what we're going to make. We're, our, our job is going to be culture. Um, the... Uh, uh, <laughs> One way to put it is, uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, in the future, you want to stay on Earth, you're going to be a poet. Culture, like you said, France. Uh, uh, you, that doesn't do it for you. You're going to be a pioneer. You're going to be out there in space. Uh, oh, you could, you could be. There are so many other things to think about. You could be a therapist. You know, you could, you could be, you know, a tour guide, party planner, vineyard, run a vineyard. You know, build, build a, run a music studio. You know, uh, like and and it. And people dealing with people. You know, I watched the the making of uh, that was called the Greatest Night in Pop about when they did the We Are the World. Yeah, which, uh, it's not my pick. But you watch this this documentary? Uh, no, I, I I I I lived it at the time, but but I would love to hear more about the documentary. What's the scenes? It's it's you know, and you watch Lionel Richie. You know, he goes on stage at the Music Awards where he wins all the awards, and then he gets he goes from there to the studio where he's got to wrangle everybody with Quincy Jones. You know, fifty of the biggest names in music. And put this thing together, but you know, you watch like what? What is a Lionel Richie? You know, Lionel Richie is a musician. He's a singer. He's an entertainer. He's an organizer of humans. You know, and you just see this sort of thing, and like, yeah, those are skills that are going to still be needed. So uh, I, I have one one little thing, a, a real life example that happened a week ago. Um, we went to uh, a, a a birthday dinner, and it was loud, and it was one of those places where. Um, harsh walls all all around, and I I tend I, I really uh, I was on the other side of the table from my father in law, and I try to be aware of like man can people even hear things and stuff, and um, th uh, this is totally true Andrew, um, I got up to go to the bathroom and I had the thought like well he's got hearing aids but man wouldn't it be great if he uh, you know if he had closed captioning and on in the, I don't know, 30 paces till I got to the bathroom, uh, I, I clicked the action button and waited for chat GPT to connect. And I say, and, and then I step up to the urinal and I'm alone. So it's not that creepy, but, but, and I say, Hey, uh, is there anybody creating a set of augmented reality, smart glasses, that could possibly real time translate noisy environments and give closed captioning at all times. And it came back and then uh, while I'm peeing, it comes back with, yeah, there are five of them. And then I was just like, Hey, can you, are you, uh, uh, here's the list. And I, and again, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm busy. I say, are you able to just email those to me? And it says, uh, uh, not yet. And then, uh, still peeing, I said, um, find out the CEOs of all five and make a bulleted list. And then I finished, uh, and it says, okay, you got it. And then I, I zipped up and I flushed and bef and I washed my hands. And then before I left, uh, I emailed all five of those CEOs and I said, Hey, this one's personal for me. I, you know, I'm seeing my father-in-law and my father get disconnected, and my kids have grown up always having uh, uh, 
uh, closed captioning on, and it's not that we have problems with hearing, we just really want to fully experience the entire story, uh, so we don't want to miss a word. Um, uh, 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 anyway, uh, uh, I, I, uh, me and some other folks, a little bit, uh, have some reach. I'd love to talk to you and see if I can help out. Uh, by the time we got home after dinner, that particular CEO had already responded, and we're going to talk on Monday. And uh, so this is my pick. This is um, uh, it, it, it's it, it's a lower fidelity uh, thing, but it's real and it's happening. And this is how fast not only are things being created, but how fast uh, influencers and uh, and and people can do. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> Xander glasses can help you see what they're saying. Hi, I'm Alex Westner. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Xander. Xander has developed smart captioning glasses that project real-time captions of what other people are saying right in your field of view. It's like having speech bubbles of in-person conversations. Over the past two years, hundreds of people with hearing challenges have tried our prototypes, including a close collaboration with the Veterans Administration, where we work directly with veterans experiencing severe hearing loss. We're proud to share that Xander glasses are now available. We are fulfilling orders from the VA and moving through our waiting list of over 1,500 individuals and growing. We look forward to engaging with you. Thank you. You so, can't hear. Uh, so yeah, so they're they're at the kind of SDK phase where you know it's not the the final uh, commercial product, but. Uh, man, I, I'll let you know how it goes talking to him, but that would be cool, cool. Yeah, things are moving fast. We've talked about this before. I think we could do a whole episode too on like the manufacturing and like there's, now that AI has accelerated so much, a lot of people are looking at more at hardware and physical things. And when you start to think about, there are two levels of manufacturing. One is to make the raw materials. The other thing is to make the things like the iPhone. And it's hard to make every, like an iPhone from start to finish in any place other than China, because within one region, you've got the batteries, you've got the glass, you've got all this. But as you start to think about, you know, we showed, we taught, we showed the, the latest iteration of the Tesla robot, I think on a show a mm -hmm. few weeks ago, you start to think about when, you know, you get millions of these robots or, you know, Elon talks about a billion of them by the end of the next decade, you know, and like what that means. Uh, and then from a manufacturing point of view, and then we're not ready. I don't think we've wrapped our heads around where things were headed, but uh, yeah, it's great. exciting. I, I, I'm glad, I'm glad we're here to <laughs> remind everyone. Uh, did you have a particular pick? I got two picks. Number one is uh, I used this earlier. Uh, these are, if, if you, are you familiar with these LCD boards? Um, LCDs. Oh yeah, it looks it looks like an e-ink thing almost. So what it is, it's basically like an LCD material, and you take you can use this pen, and you can just draw on it, and it has a small battery in there. It doesn't go anywhere. It just stays there, right? It just stays inside of there. Mm -hmm. But if you want a scratch pad or an idea pad, or you just you just press a button and it deletes. And That's I had a thing on here and it stays there for weeks. Like I drew something a month ago and I came back in here and it was still on there because it takes a charge to get rid of it. So if you want to sketch something out, like when I work on memory stuff and I want to just sort of like rapidly just create a bunch of, you know, draw something or whatever, it's just super, super useful to do, to use one of these things. So they're like 20 bucks or something. They're just cheap on Amazon. So they're not an expensive tool. Yeah. I, I was about to say, I, 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 I think that a very small version of it was a, I hate to call it a toy, but but Callie's been yeah. using one for for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah for like yeah, toys. So I just got a bigger one, which I can sometimes if I want to explain things on video. Oh, it's that's helpful, great. But also, yeah. So anyhow, they're pretty cool. This one I, I like the contrast. It had pretty good contrast on it, and so um, you, so I had one years ago that would actually output and let it go export it to your phone, but I realized like I just want to use it as sort of just a scratch pad. So it's right. super useful for that. Um, my pick, I've got, a, I've got a show that it did one season, but the season's fairly self-contained, so you can just watch this. And when it first came out, uh, I'm talking about Brave New World, which was a, 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 bar, was a marquee show for Peacock when Peacock launched. And did you watch it? 
Uh, no, but I referenced it uh, uh, in World's Greatest Con, but yeah. So the, the, the miniseries Brave New World, which is based on the book, um, it got not very good reviews from the critics, right? It was, it was actually, uh, Rotten Tomatoes had a 47% score. But the thing I've learned to realize is I don't trust critic scores at all in Rotten Tomatoes anymore, at all, and for a couple reasons. Uh, one is a number of the critics, like anybody at the blog, like it's not like critics like they used to be. Um, I have a theory that critics, a lot of critics don't watch stuff. They watch a few episodes and they, if we've, we've seen a thing in journalism and research, we've seen a thing in scientific journals, how much research papers are faked. I think there is a tremendous amount of that going on the online TV and film criticism where I read a lot of stuff and I go like, I don't know if they really, I think they watched maybe an episode or two and they skimmed ahead. I don't think they watched this thing. It's like, you know, to watch a show takes eight hours of investment. And I think they watched the first couple and maybe the last one. And said so this, I really think, I think, I think there's a big scale. I think we talked just about this. I think there's a massive amount of fraud going on. I, 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 yes. Doing... Well, uh, think about how incentives are aligned, where if you have to, uh, the more reviews you do, the more you get paid and the more your star rises. Um, uh, uh, here's one algorithm. Actually watch and write a thoughtful critique and review of everything you do. Two, um, uh, estimate how buzzworthy or 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 fast or early you could be on riding on maybe getting your name on the movie poster uh and uh, or you know uh, just smell whether or not you think it's going to be a hit from the outside and then justify things later yeah and i think you know follow a couple of key reviewers whatever a couple hours later post yours whatever so i this was was uh uh Developed by David Weiner, it stars Jessica Brown Findlay, Harry Lloyd remember from Game of Thrones. You know he played a POS there. Alden Enreich is in it. Uh, really good cast. Uh, I was I didn't know what to make of this. I first I avoided it. It came out back in 2020, and I looked at it, read some reviews that just sort of dissed it, and then I was like, you know what? I went on my trip. I said I'm going to download some stuff. I'm going to. I'll watch this because I'm interested. Brave New World was was a thing that I remember. I, you know, I thought I, I read it, but I fell asleep through it. Like you know, listened too late at night, forgetting to turn off my audiobook thing. So rereading it. It was your I mean, soma. <laughs> you you would listen to yeah. it in your sleep, and you would wake up, and it would say, "A gram is better than a dam." <laughs> so so yeah, I, I basically I I wish I even remember that much. So I decided to watch this thing, and I downloaded like four episodes, and I was the first one, and I'm like. This is actually good. And the guy in the second, like, this is really good. And the world building here, they're doing, they're making some choices. I know that they want it to be a series with multiple seasons. So they're setting some stuff up there. We don't kind of revisit. It does its part. But I, I really dug it, Brian. I really dug it. It is, it is a really good, they tried to do a reimagined Fahrenheit 451, which mm -hmm. I couldn't, I started watching the first five minutes and I'm seeing all this text appear. And then I'm like, no, we're about so there are no books, but we have social media. I'm like, no, you don't you don't get what Fahrenheit 451 is about. It's it's taking away that ability to think in the form of text, like literally getting rid of all forms of text other than symbolic stuff. And and that was when you take when you when you try to make a show like, yeah, no, we're gonna have it'll be messages and like, no, no, you you you're those can be very legitimate ways to form. You have long form tweets. I was just I was like. You didn't get it. <laughs> like, like you, you did not understand this concept. So I'm not going to watch the rest of it, which nobody did. I watched this and like you have they they bring in there's an AI element to it. They bring this in, and I think it's very, very, very true to this. And I think that for some people is that like, you know, part of Brave New World is the idea that, hey, the state controls your body, your body belongs to everybody, and we're always going to be drugging ourselves. And I think a lot of people think that's a cool idea. And I think a lot of people probably were like, this came out in the middle of the pandemic where many people sort of clung to the idea that government came forward as this parent that was going to tell you to stay in your pajamas all day and we'll take care of you. And many people found that appealing. And uh, I think that was hard for them to watch something that was critical of that. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll add that one to the list. Uh, is it, it, it sounds like it's faithful to the original uh, over a hundred years it, old it, now. 1936 yeah. it, it's almost it takes it really yeah i think the, the original was way ahead of its time it, the, the original feels like a book almost written in the 50s yeah. um 
I, I was shocked I, when I found I, out how early it was. Yeah, I, I think that I think that it takes they, they talk about they use the term the social body, what you do in a social body. I think they really got the themes. I really felt like they got the themes of it. And you know, obviously they wanted to take it and turn it into a series and stuff, but uh a very it's one of the things I like to I like sci fi where I go, Oh, they get it. You know, and, and obviously we all have our own opinion what Gideon is, but you know, I could go on about like, you know, my problem with the Watchmen movie. It's like, man, I don't I don't think uh Snyder understood what Adrian Veidt was all about. <laughs> you know, like like well, I don't hey, think you got this. Uh uh I just now realized that it's now past five o'clock on Friday and I have to I'm still covered in the the non alcoholic IPA that I spat out over myself. <laughs> uh um, well, Brian, we all have our problems. <laughs> <laughs> but how how's it been? Yes. So that is my pick. It is Brave New World. It's available on Peacock. Uh, I was able to watch the first few episodes because I was on in India and it was on Netflix India, and I decided to subscribe to Peacock to watch that. So Brave. There you go. It's been weird. A <laughs> uh, lot of gratuitous sex. Uh, yes. Although some I mean, described them but, as P. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, some of the review are like, so it's PG orgies. I'm like, I'm okay with PG orgies. I don't need, I don't want to watch an actual orgy, folks. Well, I mean, they, yeah, that was a significant part of the book, though, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, they called it PG orgies. Like, 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 oh, no, we needed, we needed more. You know, it wasn't <laughs> enough, you know. All right, so I just now realized that uh, I now have to figure out how to make this. Uh, uh, let me add this to the list of to-dos. Uh, weird things. Uh, I recorded it as video, so I have to translate it. And also, I have to post the uh, Cord Killers one. Um, I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, all right. Here. Uh, 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 stream. Goodbye. We love you. Bye. <laughs> okay. I, I said I love you. I'm just saying. <laughs>